to consent apparently. So let's do that. Yeah. All right. So uh, hi everyone, and uh, thanks for coming this morning. Um, I know I didn't uh, share any uh, PDF ahead of time, so I'll keep this as uh, light as possible. What I'm going to do for the next hour is tell you about a bunch of uh, stories, a uh, bunch of stories from 100 years ago and a bunch of stories from this summer um, and a bunch of hypothetical stories uh, in the future. So um, yeah, feel free um, to, to cast more hypotheticals if you want and uh, you know, interrupt me if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments. Um, all of this is kind of ongoing work, uh, yeah, very fresh and recent and so you know, I'm happy to get any uh, feedback or know what isn't clear and, and so on. Okay, so, uh, so some of you actually, some, some members of my group have seen the first half of this talk but hopefully the second half will uh, still have something, something new. Okay, so uh, this talk is called The Lady Keeps Tasting Coffee and it's named after a more historic uh, story that is familiar to most in causal inference but in case it isn't, I'll, I'll recap it. Um, it turns out that uh, in, in Britain, uh, uh, tea is a very serious matter and uh, they take very seriously whether uh, the tea goes into the milk or the milk goes into the tea. And, uh, and you know, so th these are, there's some interesting cartoons you'll see making fun of people who do the other way around. Um, but this is taken pretty seriously. So sometimes newspapers, this is actually from a newspaper, newspapers actually tell you exactly how you should make British tea well. And they will tell you, as you can see over here, that the, that the tea must be poured into the milk and not the other way around. And so this actually takes us back to a, a fairly old story from about 100 years ago. I've, I've not been able to nail down the exact year. And if any of you know the exact year, then, then you can tell me. Um, and, and there was this uh, tea party that was happening in the UK. And, uh, and the guy asked the girl, okay, would you like some tea? And she says, no, thank you. Like, you know, tea and milk is not the same as milk and tea. And uh, I prefer it one way while, you know, you've, pre you've prepared it the other way. The guy's like, are you serious? Can you really tell them apart? Like, uh, you're kidding, right? And she's like, no, actually, I can tell them apart. And um, I prefer it the other way. And so this guy's like, okay, I, I, I don't believe her. Uh, let's see if she's uh, telling the truth. So apparently with her uh, then fiance or uh, then partner or something like that, they um, the guy and her fiance set up an experiment and what they did was they prepared, the, the, the lady's name was Muriel Bristol and they prepared eight cups of tea. Um, uh, in four of them, they put the milk into the tea and in four of them, the tea into the milk. Okay, so the white one is milk first and the brown one is uh, tea first. Uh, and then they, they randomized the order. So they, they somehow picked, uh, you know, maybe they flipped some coins or something like that. They came up a way of generating a random ordering and they presented it to her in a completely random order. And then they asked her to guess, okay, you know, taste and guess uh, which one is which. And as history has it, and it's pretty remarkable, but she got every one of them perfectly correct. So she, she was a perfect score. And uh, I find that pretty uh, remarkable. When I read the story, it was like, what? How did she actually get that like perfectly? I thought, you know, maybe she's good, but she's, she's gonna make some mistakes, uh, but she didn't apparently. And so uh, the guy is, uh, you know, Ronald Fisher and uh, this story has, you know, now ev everyone knows it as the lady tasting tea experiment um, as, uh, you know, and, and so he did this calculation back then. He's like, oh, wow, she got it perfect. What's the chance that, you know, she actually has no idea, but she would still actually be perfect. And so he said, oh, well, there are 70 combinations of, uh, you know, of random guesses, like, you know, you could have gotten all four right or all four wrong or three right, one wrong, and two right, two wrong, and you know, the 70 possibilities, and you know, she got you know, that one of them, which is perfect. And, and so he said, well, the probability is one over 70 that this would happen just purely by chance. And so it's, at least in the literature, one of the first examples, if not the first, apparently Glenn Schaefer told me that it's not the first, there are earlier examples of calculations of this style, but at least it's one of the first examples of a, of a p-value of, a, you know, randomization based causal inference. Uh, this was a design of an experiment intended to, you know, test, uh, uh, you know, something causal and so on. So uh, a lot of these areas. So in fact, this was written in his book called the design of experiments in the 1920s um, and started off obviously several fields of, uh, of research. But I think most people like the story because it's very crisp and he, you know, explained it very neatly and 
did the calculation clearly and so when people in 1920s read it they're like wow that was that was you know very uh, uh, very elegant and so the story has become famous almost as a result of how elegantly fisher was able to state what happened and how he thought through the whole process and so on because of course at that time it was not standard thinking um now um unfortunately if you think a little bit more about the experiment you'll realize that the odds were actually completely stacked against muriel so it happened to be the case that she was perfect and she got you know uh, she got everything right but uh, if she had made one mistake so if she had gotten three right one wrong or whatever you know in terms of pairs if you want to think about it that way but if she had gotten uh, six right and two wrong out of the eight or something like that then uh, then essentially uh, she would have uh, her her p value or whatever this uh, uh, calculation would have yielded is the probability that a chance guess would have yielded well i guess one is impossible you have to make two errors but uh, maybe if she knew it was four, four and four then you have to make two errors but she could have um uh, maybe if she'd not known it was four and four she might have uh, anyway she might have made more but um so in, in that case the calculation would have showed that it was uh, about a 0.24 chance that just random guessing would have gotten um let's say 6 out of 8 and uh, and then one would have said oh well that's you know 25% that you can attribute it just to chance it's not statistically significant and so on which is kind of ridiculous because you know even if she was really good she really needs to be perfect in order for it to pass the you know 0.05 level or whatever and you know even if you don't care about the 0.05 level 0.25 or around that range is is really pretty like yeah you can you can think that that would be attributed to chance um so i think that if she had done this calculation herself before the experiment she might have said okay maybe i'm not going to play this game because the odds are stacked against me either i'm perfect or you'll attribute it to chance and so um this is kind of unfair so you know with the benefit of a 100 years of hindsight i would have designed this experiment quite differently and and so i did i did this summer and uh, and now i'll tell you about the experiment that i designed and ran and what happened and so on okay so here's the outline of the talk i'll i'll take you through uh, six versions of this experiment um the first three versions actually happened and i'm i'm, I'm doing it for the purpose of gen gently introducing a sequence of ideas so the first three versions are called guessing betting and learning and then the next three never happened and um and but they could happen and uh, and so those are uh, what i call hedging credit assignment and uh, cooperation and competition so um so we'll 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 gently introduce these as we go along okay so let me tell you what i did this summer instead so this experiment uh, i'm well i'm writing a paper with this title and this paper is very very slow progress because <laughs> i'm extremely busy these days so um so the the paper is titled the lady keeps tasting coffee and in this case uh, my partner who's a professor in the machine learning department uh, leila wave she was the willing participant i did not get an erb but uh, i did ask for her permission and and this is how it actually proceeded i told her let's play a game and you know whenever i say something like that she's suspicious she's like okay maybe maybe not not sure i said well, it involves coffee and then she was like okay sure i'm i'm down anything with coffee and and leila's down to play um okay so what did i do so this is how the game worked i i went to the kitchen by myself in my kitchen there's a beautiful breville uh, espresso machine um that we bought just about a month before the covid lockdown and uh, and it it has served us well during this lockdown when we couldn't go out and get coffee so i would go by myself to the breville machine i would fl- i would flip a coin um and uh, and i'm showing you a very nice coin that i found actually it's um, a 20 it's a recent 2020 swiss coin i believe it's one of the smallest coins in the world or something and it has this beautiful photograph of albert einstein <laughs> sticking out his tongue at you um uh, but anyway so i go flip this coin it, the coin comes up heads and so what what does heads mean you know i don't show leila the coin obviously and uh, but i just present to her i, I make two cups of coffee um i put in one of them the coffee first that's the brown one and the other one i put milk first that's the white one i make two cups and um i present um uh, i present the two cups to her but left uh, being coffee and right being milk because you know because it came up heads um and then i asked leila to guess okay uh, what does she think the uh, order is which one is milk first and which one is coffee first and so let's say that she says uh, the left is milk and the right is coffee and then i tell her okay you know actually 
that's wrong. Uh, uh, you know that you know it was like the left was coffee and the right was milk. And uh, she says, okay, I see. That's what happened. Then I go back the next. So actually, not the next day, but later in the afternoon, we have two sets of these coffees every day. Uh, so I go back in the afternoon. I flip the coin again. This time, let's say it comes up tails. Um, uh, and so I present. Uh, you know, I don't show her the outcome, obviously. And then I just present two cups to her. And this time, milk is on the left and coffee is on the right. And I ask her to guess which one is which. And uh, obviously, the cups are otherwise identical and things like that. But I'm I'm showing these colors to you for uh, for visualization for your purpose. Uh, she doesn't see these colors naturally. She has to guess. And so she guesses and she guesses milk left and coffee right. And uh, this time she's right. So I tell her, oh, actually, you know, wow, you, you got this right. This time she says, great, let's go on. And this game continues now day after day, day after day. Okay. And so this, uh, this actually happened at the, towards the end of May, uh, early part of June, uh, pre-NeurIPS deadline was when we were running this experiment to keep ourselves entertained. All right, so, so how do we do inference now? So this game has been going, how do we do inference? Um, so we have these results. So you can think of R1, R2 as being the results, minus one loss, plus one is you know, right. Uh, think of ST as being the sum of these results. Um, and uh, the null hypothesis over here, let's say is there is no difference between milk and coffee and coffee and milk, that's, that's the null. Uh, and let's say alpha is some kind of a type one error uh, target that we you know, want to test this null at. Um, then under the null, uh, this process ST, which is the sum of my, uh, sum of Layla's uh, errors or results, um, that's a martingale under the null. And for those who are not familiar with martingale, what that means is it's, it's like, basically it's like a random walk. It's the simplest random walk. It's like I'm tossing a fair coin and equal probability of going up or down and so on. So it's just like a random walk. The expected value of ST given the past is just the previous step ST minus one. Okay, so that's, that's, what, that's what a martingale means. Okay, so that's, that's the behavior under the null. So how can we reject the null? So for example, this is one example of a rule. You might choose to use different types of rules. Here's just one example. Um, that if SN is large, for example, then you might want to reject the null. So here I've written it in terms of absolute value, um, looking at differences in either direction. But if you want to make it one-sided, you can make it one-sided. Essentially, the idea is that there are many, many more correct guesses than false guesses, then you'd think that the null is not true. Okay, and so that's like if SN is gro grows above a boundary and uh, this, um, this boundary looks like uh, square root log, uh, actually this, I, I should have written SN divided by N. So this is the, if the average is above uh, like a one over square root of N, then uh, you can say it's not chance. Uh, otherwise there should be an extra, uh, I should have multiplied this whole thing by N. So it, it should be like, uh, if SN crosses like square root N log N, log one over alpha, something of that kind, then you can reject the null. Now, you know, how you get this exact form, maybe you don't have to bother for the purpose of this talk, but random walks are extremely well studied in literature. And essentially you can just find a boundary that with high probability it will never cross if it's really a random walk. But if there is some signal and there's some drift in the upward direction because Leila is making more correct guesses than mistakes, then eventually you will cross this boundary with probability one. So um, you can design such boundaries. and. Um, and so this is what I call the first version of the game, which is the guessing game. So Laila guesses at each step, it, it happens sequentially. The sequential aspect is important because if it's easy to tell them apart, this experiment will end sooner, maybe after eight cups or 10 cups. But if it's really hard to tell them apart, but still possible to tell them apart, then maybe it takes 20 cups or 50 cups or something of that kind. And you don't have to fix the number of cups in advance and randomize them once and present them once and so on. You know, like if the problem is much easier, maybe your Layla's tasting way more cups than she needs to prove her skill in this process. Um, and if, she, if, the, if it's much harder than, but still possible, then maybe there isn't enough data yet. So doing things sequentially, you don't have to make this choice. It can be made kind of uh, adaptively. So the, um, this is the guessing version of the lady keeps tasting coffee. So let me pause and see if there are any questions about this first part before I get into more interesting versions of the game. Um, I had a question. So, um, so you're you're running the test still of particular n, like you reject the null. This actually goes process on forever. Is... It goes on forever. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you can stop whenever you want to stop, but this process actually 
this is a, a the the type one error control is uh, no no matter when you so at every step n you can check is this rule satisfied um, uh, and there's no uh, maximum n the probability that there ever under the null that there ever exists any n for which this happens is at most alpha so it's actually a an infinite boundary crossing inequality kind of thing it's it's a con it's a type one error control uniformly over infinite time from one to infinity um, so you if you want you can stop it if you say i'm never going to run this beyond 100 cups you'll get too bored of doing this experiment that's fine You're, i can find a different boundary that uh, spends all its alpha between time zero and 100 the one i'm presenting over here has no maximum limit on the time you can go on forever without violating type one error control but I'm not allowed to. Um, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go for it. But uh, uh, but I'm not allowed to see the result and then choose an end, right? You can do that. That's fine. So you can uh, you can look at every time step. You don't even have to choose an end. You can look at every step. So after the first step, you can see if this rule happened. If you, after the second step, you can see if this happened. After the third step, you can. See. So it's like you can continuously peek at the data. And you can see at every step, is SN larger than this boundary? Can I stop now? You don't have to prefix anything in advance. You don't have to decide I will stop at time 25, nothing. You can stop at time 13. If at time 13, this, uh, re this red formula happens, then you can stop at time 13. If it happens at time 84, you can stop at time 84. So it's a fully sequential process that you can continuously peek at the data as it's coming in. And you can adaptively decide when to stop and the type one error control will still be guaranteed. Zach, you had a question? Yeah, so um, now this is very interesting. So I guess comparing to the lady tasting tea experiment, there's three differences. The first that it's coffee. I love this change, this is very good. The second, I guess, is each trial you're telling Layla whether she's correct or incorrect, and this is like how learning is gonna come in, I guess, I like this. But the third difference is each trial you're presenting a pair of copies, yes. whereas I guess I'm wondering, I'll, I was thinking a natural extension would just be, you show just one copy that's either yes. milk first or coffee first. I'm confused intuitively yes. why you have to give this pair rather than just one at a time. That's a great question. Both are, both are valid. And it's, a, it's, so, so this, it's called the unpaired versus the paired. So the unpaired one, I prepared two, and then I'd flip a coin to show her one of them and she guesses which one. In the paired one, I give her both and she guesses which is which. Now the, the question is, is this cooperative or is, am I trying to test her? So basically the way to think about it is the unpaired case is actually much harder. If I only present you one and you have to guess, that's actually hard. If I present you two, you can compare them and you can, you can cancel out the commonality and only focus on the differences. It's easier. So if my, if our interest is, Leila and me together want to tell if the null is true or not. If we are interested in testing the null, then we might want to do the paired experiment. Instead, if I am interested in testing Leila's skill, then I might want to try the unpaired experiment. So it's, in the, it's a question of, is it a challenge? Or are we interested in the scientific question of, is there any difference between milk and coffee and coffee and milk? And in this case, we were just curious, like how could Muriel have told a hundred years ago? We were curious scientifically, and so I did not, I'm not interested in dragging this process on forever and, made, and challenging Layla to do it. I, I really want to know, is there a difference? And the idea is in this paired setting, if there is no difference, Layla doesn't get any help from pairing or unpairing. It's, it's going, you're going to have a martingale regardless whether you have the paired or unpaired. But if there is a difference, if, if, if there actually is a difference between them, then the paired setting will have more power and you will be able to stop sooner. Yep, great, thank you, thank you. That's a great question. Wait, so so is there a difference? Did she reject the null? <laughs> um, it depends on what is the null you're interested in testing. If the null you're interested in testing is this one that I've written here, that there is no difference in milk and coffee and coffee and milk, you can try either experiment. Both experiments control type one error. Both experiments will eventually have power, uh, but but the paired experiment will stop sooner. Um, you, right. You, I guess I'm just kind of curious, like, did you finish the experiment until a point where I just curious, is there a difference? I, 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 uh, we, I only ran the paired experiment and I will go on because, uh, for, to tell you what we actually did. This is the first version, which is for simplicity. Okay, cool, cool. But uh, there's, there's more interesting things that will happen now. Um, um, I had one last question. Uh, 
so uh, in the fisher setup i like since uh, she doesn't know whether she was right or wrong her ability let's say her ability to guess the right thing is p and not is 1 minus p but here the person can improve right so yes and you you're, you're so, looking ahead at in the next few slides yes this is exactly okay. what i'm going to be getting so this is the six versions of the game and you're uh, yeah you're already looking ahead that's the right idea but let, yeah let's get to it slowly yeah so i i i'm going under the assumption that our interest is in uh testing this null is there any difference between milk and coffee and coffee and milk if there's no difference that is learn you can bet you can guess you can do whatever you want if there's no difference you're not going to be able to reject the null ever and uh, if there is a difference then maybe you'll get better and you know you can so that kind of so we'll we'll cover that yeah, thank okay. you so now let, let's look at v2 uh, which is going to be going from guessing to betting okay so here's a photograph from you know one of the first days of the experiment these are the two cups of espresso and uh, and what you'll see visually is what we saw visually as well is that there's actually surprisingly a very clear difference between the two okay so let me now tell you exactly what i did is that uh, i would prepare the coffee separately and you know have the milk ready separately and then in one case pour milk pour coffee not mix it with a spoon and then the other case pour coffee pour milk and not mix it with a spoon so if you mix everything with a spoon then then uh, it maybe it's harder but for my experiment that i was running i poured the milk into the coffee or the coffee into the milk and i just presented it as is so when you do that what i'll tell you what you're seeing over here what you're seeing over here is um, because i was running experiment i knew leila didn't know this but uh, but what i saw was um, that when you pour the the left one is coffee first and you pour the milk into the coffee so what happens when you pour the milk into the coffee is that the coffee rises the milk kind of dunks to the bottom and the coffee rises to the top so it's browner and then in the in the right one it's coffee so it's it's coffee into the milk so when you pour the coffee into the milk the coffee dunks to the bottom the milk rises to the top so it's whiter and so as soon as i prepared my first cup i was like oh this is going to be easy <laughs> so but this was just a fun game anyway so anyway so anyway so i presented it this way so as you can tell that um you know it, it depend my preparations are not always perfect so actually it wouldn't always be this stark i'm i've taken one photograph when it was particularly stark to show you but sometimes it can get a little bit confusing so what if it gets a little bit confusing so here's a different version which is more interesting so this is the betting version um and here leila is going to start off with uh, she's lebanese and uh, so she's going to start off with 1 lebanese lira this is the amount of money she's bringing to the experiment and uh, and what she's going to do is uh, and as before you know i'm going to present her these two cups and instead of just guessing she's instead going to bet uh, and so lambda is going to represent leila's bet and so zero means she's completely confused and has no idea what's going on one means she is damn sure that it is milk coffee minus 1 means she's damn sure that it's coffee milk point 2 means ah uh, she thinks it's milk on the left and coffee on the right but like not super sure so she's betting 20 cents out of the amount that she has or in or really she's betting 20% of what she has in this case it's 20 cents because she has a uh, uh, she has a 1 lira to start off with or 1 lib to start off with so it's 20 cents but otherwise lambda equal to 0.2 means i'm betting 20% of what i have on milk coffee and minus 0.2 means i'm betting 20% of what i have on coffee milk okay so she chooses based on what she sees how much she wants to bet on the next outcome okay and uh, and then i tell her okay you know that's the answer the answer is well it was you're, you're not right actually the it was well here in this case r1 means uh, it came up heads or something like that or you know you had bet the wrong way or something so then what happens is leila's wealth uh you know she lost the bet or bet the wrong way things like that so this is how her wealth changes it's her original wealth l1 is her uh, think of l as being lebanese or livre or leila's wealth uh, that's what l stands for and so l1 is her wealth after the first time step is her previous wealth l0 times 1 plus lambda 1 times r1 in this case r1 is minus 1 and lambda 1 is 0.2 so it's l0 times 0.8 so her 1 livre becomes 0.8 livre because because she got it wrong this time Okay so this is how it's going to proceed now in the next step again i don't show her what happens i present her two cups of coffee she bets again this time let's say she bets 0.4 on milk coffee this time she's right it is actually milk coffee 
And so what does her wealth become? It, it, it's, it becomes L1, her previous wealth times, so 0.4 is 40% of her current wealth is how much she's betting. And, um, and so it, L1 times one plus lambda two times R2, this time it becomes L1 times 1.4, which happens to be 0.8 times 1.4 is 1.12. So now she has 1.12 leverage. She started with one, now she has 1.12 leverage. Okay, and so now this process goes on and LT is her money at the teeth step is just this product of one plus lambda I times RI. And what is lambda I? Lambda I are what I call predictable bets. So what is predictable means? It means I have to make the bet before I see the rth outcome. So lambda I is allowed to depend on the previous steps, but it can't depend on RI itself. You see RI after you present lambda I. Okay, so you first present your bet and then you see the outcome naturally, right? You, you can't see the outcome and then bet that doesn't make sense. Um, that's not a bet anymore then. So lambda I is some number between minus one and one that uh, Leila is going to present depending on her level of confidence or how much she wants to be this key and so on. And LT is just her wealth at this time. Okay. And so this game goes on forever and we're going to track her wealth. Now the nice thing over here is that if the null is true, that is if there is actually no difference between uh, you know, the two uh, milk and coffee or coffee and milk, then this LT is a non-negative martingale. Okay, and non, the non-negative part means that she cannot bet more money than she has. She has to bet a fraction of the wealth that she has. And so her money uh, like, uh, cannot go below zero. So this uh, LT is always non-negative. That's the non-negative part. And it's a martingale. And the way to check this easily is the definition of martingale is quite easy. It's just the expected value of LT given the past is LT minus one. That's the thing to check. And so if you want to look at this product of T, uh, and if you, if you ask, what is the expected value of LT given the past? Well, the first T minus one elements of the product just pop out of the conditional expectation. And you're just taking the expectation of the last step. So you're asking, what is the expected value of one plus lambda T times RT? Now, the idea is that lambda T is predictable. So it's, kind of, it's fixed uh, at this step when you're taking that conditional expectation. And RT is a random coin flip. If there's under the null, there's no difference. RT is simply plus one or minus one with equal probability. And so the expected value of one plus lambda T R T is just one. And so LT in expectation is just one times one times one times one times one. And that's what's happening in expectation. And otherwise it's fluctuating, but basically this is a martingale and it's non-negative. So it's a non-negative martingale. And it's what we mean, what we think of when we mean a fair game. When someone goes to gamble in a casino and they're playing a fair game, this is what it means. It basically means their wealth is a non-negative martingale. They're not going to gain money. They're not going to lose money. Net, at any stopping time, they're going to have the same money uh, that they had when they started. So that's, that's the notion that it captures. Okay, so that's, that's the initial wealth, of course, L0. Now, so how do we do inference now? So now Leila has been betting there's this non-negative martingale and how do we do inference? So there's two ways to think about it. So the first one is that at any stopping time, um, the expected, uh, so actually at any finite stopping time, the expected value of L tau is equal to one. This is what Schaefer called a, a betting score uh, recently, but this is just a, this is called the optional stopping theorem for martingales. It just means that uh, there is no fancy stopping rule that you can come up with uh, such that you make money in a fair game. So if, if the null is true, then any stopping time you can come up with, let's say, uh, you know, I, I make three mistakes and I get three times correct and then I'll stop. You know, there's nothing really you can do. The expected value of your wealth at any stopping time is your initial wealth, which is one. Um, and if, if this actually holds true even for infinite stopping times with a less than equal to sign. So the expected value of L tau is less than equal to one for any stopping time, finite or infinite. Which just means that if I'm restrict, if I'm allowing myself to go on potentially forever, I, I, I'm never still going to make money. I can potentially lose money, but not make it. So... So that's this uh, optional stopping theorem. So you can use that for inference. Uh, another a tool you can use for inference is Veal's inequality. So uh, this is uh, a uniform Markov's inequality for non-negative super martingale. So what is a super martingale? So a martingale is something whose expectation stays constant. A super martingale is the expectation goes down over time. So this is like an unfair game where the odds are with the casino and you're playing a game in which in expectation you will lose money. That's a non-negative super martingale. So this wheels inequality holds for non-negative super martingale. So it also holds for non-negative martingales like our, like Laila's wealth LT. 
Okay, and so what does it say? It's a, it's a uniform, time uniform notion of Markov. So it says, um, like if you remember Markov's inequality, it says the same thing over here except without the exists T. It says for a non-negative random variable, the probability that LT is greater than one over alpha is at most alpha because the expected value is one. Um, but now Wheels says, I can make this uniform over time. I can take an infinite union bound over, over infinite times. The probability that there exists any time from one to infinity at which Leila's wealth will exceed one over alpha under the null is at most alpha. So if alpha is 0 0.05, then basically this is guaranteeing that at no point in the game from one to infinity will Leila's wealth exceed 20 with high probability. With probability at least 95%, Leila's wealth will never exceed 20 if the game is really fair. So in other words, if the null is true, then Leila is very unlikely to turn one pound into 50 pounds. This is quite unlikely. So uh, there's many ways to think of this in terms of inference. You can think of the wealth directly as a measure of evidence against the null. You can just say, you can just tell me Leila made 38 pounds in this game and I'd be like, oh wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. If this was a fair game, that's super unlikely. And you can just think of Leila's wealth directly as a measure of evidence. That's called an E-value. It's, it's a statistic that who's ex a non-negative statistic whose expectation is one under the null. And so if it's large, you can say, oh, that's super impressive. Um, if you like p-values, then one over, so remember larger wealth is more evidence against the null. Smaller p-values are more evidence against the null. So you have to flip the wealth. One over the wealth um, is a, is a p-value. And in fact, you can take the running in femum as well, but essentially you, you take one over the wealth, you get a p-value instead of an e-value. So those are two ways you can express your uh, evidence against the null at any point. You can keep this as a running evidence against the null. You can uh, keep track of it. Um, if you want a particular level alpha test, so the first two notions of evidence don't have a level alpha. I can just tell you the 38 pounds and there's no alpha level associated with it. I can tell you the p-value, no alpha level. But if you said, no, I want a level alpha test, then it's very simple. I just reject the null. Whenever Leila's wealth crosses one over alpha, I, I can reject the null. And the reason that the type one error is controlled is because of Beale's inequality. It tells you that this will never happen with high probability if the null is true. Okay, so um, let me pause here and see if anybody has any questions. This is the betting game. All right. If not, let me go on to the third version of the game. Um, and, and this involves uh, uh, learning. So what's going to happen over here is actually that um, imagine yourself collecting covariates. So imagine that you collect d-dimensional covariates. Like for example, you take the temperature, you take a photograph and you look at the color, you taste it and you look at the sweetness. You're allowed to do all of that. You're allowed to actually taste the coffee. You can do all of this before making your bet. Okay, so you can collect these covariates, you can taste, you can look at the temperature, you can, you can do lots of things. And, uh, and then you make your bet. And this bet can be a function F1 of the covariates. Okay, so lambda one is just F1 of X1. And now, uh, you know, I reveal the outcome and, uh, you know, Leila's wealth changes. But now what I can do is, you know, Leila can say, oh, I see that's the outcome. Interesting. I'm going to improve my regression function based on the data collected so far. I'm going to improve it from F1 to F2. Okay, and how she does it is her choice. And then now there's, you know, the second coin comes up and Leila collects, you know, some you know, other covariates, the temperature, sweetness, and so on. Based on those covariates, she makes a different bet. Um, you know, she finds out what the outcome is. She says, oh, I see that's now her new wealth. She says, oh, now I'm going to, I, I, I see what's happening. I see when I'm making a mistake and when I'm getting it correct, I'm going to improve my regression function one more time from F2 to F3. And this process continues. So as an example of something that, you know, Leila could do is that she could run a logistic regression where uh, every time it was milk, coffee, those are one set of labeled samples. Every time it was coffee, milk, those are another set of labeled samples. She can collect the covariates. She can train a logistic regression classifier to differentiate between the two um, and, uh, and, you know, assign, you know, of course, logistic regression offers things between zero and one. She can easily translate that to things between minus one and one. And essentially, whenever the logistic regression classifier is confused, basically, it's like, I'm not sure, then she bets near zero. If the logistic regression classifier is super sure of either one or minus one, then she, she'll, she'll start guessing more, betting more confidently. So basically, she can now use 
a machine learning algorithm and she can use high dimensional covariates like a photograph she can take the pixels in the photograph things that she can train a black box if she wants machine learning algorithm in order to help her with this betting process and she can improve over time as she collects more data she can figure out oh these covariates are useless temperature is useless but oh the the sweetness is super important when i taste the bitterness i know it's coffee on the top when i taste the sweetness i know it's milk on the top so she can improve over time now the idea is still the same that if the null is true if there's no difference then there's no fancy machine learning algorithm and no fancy betting scheme that can get away from the fact that your her wealth is still a non negative martingale if the null is true nothing no amount of learning betting anything can get away from this fact and so you can still use wheels inequality or optional stopping or anything to give you inference at any time uh but if the null is false and there is a difference between the two then she can learn the difference between the two and improve her power and stop earlier and so on and what this gives rise to is a sequential and also a cooperative learning based causal inference so what is the cooperation over here you for this cooperation you have to go back to fisher and muriel muriel was at that time a phd student in algology but she was an expert in tea tasting fisher was an expert in statistics they are actually allowed to cooperate between rounds in order to help test the same null okay they have different expertise fisher can't suddenly learn how to taste tea and muriel who is doing algology is not suddenly going to learn the the basis of p values and likelihood based inference and logistic regressions or something of that kind but they can cooperate with each other muriel can say i think these are the covariates that are actually important and and fisher can say okay let's collect this data and this is how we can train the classifier and things of that kind so they can actually they can actually cooperate in order to test the same null that they're interested in testing which is is there any difference between these two preparations and um, and and that's fine and that's okay so uh, the 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 experimenter and the subject can cooperate to test a causal hypothesis or a, and and you can you you can use machine learning algorithms and you can do this sequentially and all of this can be done while maintaining type 1 error control if there is no difference no amount of cooperation or learning or sequential betting or anything can violate type 1 error control it's rigorous and it's finite sample and it's it's always guaranteed okay so anyway so this is coming soon on archive hopefully but let me pause again and see are there any questions on v3 of the algorithm which is the fact that you can learn and use machine learning to help you and you can cooperate and you know things of that kind yeah teacher this is again very interesting just because you say you're assessing a causal hypothesis i just wanted to hear your thoughts on like how you would phrase the hypothesis as causal Oh yeah. Okay. Or like I guess like no, I'm not trying to be like uh pedantic or anything either. It's just like uh is it like if I add the milk first that's going to cause um I I guess I'm not sure how to phrase it. I was just curious. I'll, I'll take back the like in this case the causal hypothesis maybe but you can I guess you can uh, you could imagine uh in these settings potential outcomes of what if things were different and what if leila had made different types of bets and guesses and what what if the outcomes had been different and things of that kind you could but i guess uh, this yeah may, maybe it's just easier to think about it as testing a scientific hypothesis let's just say that it's not a causal hypothesis it's just a scientific hypothesis there isn't really an in intervention or anything over here or something it's it's just it's a scientific hypothesis i i'm i'm designing an experiment to test it but the experimental design is is sequential and the design of the experiment itself can be changing with time so you know for example i can start off with an unpaired experiment and then like leila can tell me hey you know why are you giving me this unpaired experiment it would be so much easier if you gave me the pair i'd be like oh okay i can change you can literally start off with an unpaired experiment and switch to a paired experiment midway that's fine um you can start off collecting three covariates but if leila then says actually these other covariates are super informative then we can correct more covariates so the dimension doesn't have to remain constant over time the machine learning algorithm doesn't have to remain constant you can you can say like oh this logistic regression classifier isn't working so well let me switch to a random forest or you know so like you can change the design of the experiment as you're going along so you can think about this as yeah let's i'll take back the causal hypothesis it's a scientific hypothesis uh, we are testing it using 
randomization based causal inference, but in a different like kind of sequential cooperative or a learning based fashion. Yeah, I love that it can iteratively change. I guess so. My first comment sounded kind of critical, but maybe so maybe to be more complimentary. I think it's more than testing something causal. It's more just testing an independence assumption, I guess, right? Or it's testing the independence of the order with the outcome of the copy, I guess. In this case, but uh, this the, the all of the story is really to help understand what's really going on. You can generalize this much beyond like yeah. independence testing or things like that. Like. Uh, yeah. Cool. I love it. Yep. I had a quick question. So now, <clears throat> now you have a lot more data that you could use on the experimenter side too to construct like different test statistics. Yeah. Absolutely. You could use the X's, for example. Yeah. Um, have you thought about that at all? Well, I mean, the X's are being used for for constructing bets, and the uh, the argument is that this kind of um, if you can you can capture you can kind of uh, we can talk about this some other time, but this is in some sense, um, yeah, uh, yeah. May maybe there are other ways of doing things, but this is in some sense, I, I think of this as a prototypical way. You can always capture um, the information in those covariates using some kind of a sufficient statistic, uh, uh, which you can transform into kind of a bet or a level of confidence, things like that in, in this case. But I think in a more complicated setting where the scientific hypothesis is not like this, um, you, you can still, I think, bet on outcomes. They don't, the bet doesn't have to be on a binary outcome. The bet can be on a more complicated type of outcome. But the idea is that you can always think about uh, testing a hypothesis as making bets. And, and if, if your bets turn out, and it could be multiple bets, as we'll see now, there could be multiple bets involved and so on. And, and we'll see that in, the, in, in what's coming up. Yeah, I, I just mean um, using something beyond just the L information to test this hypothesis, right? So your test statistic is still like the wealth or whatever at, at a given time, right? Yeah. But you could potentially use this other X information. I just wonder if that would buy you some extra power or something. Yeah, I'm not sure. If, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to do it sequentially. The idea is actually that revealing the X before the bet is made so in some sense that's corrupted and the only thing that's uncorrupted is the R that's like, that's the only uncorrupted thing. Um, I'm, I'm really only using like one bit per round to, in order to enable inference. And, um, and it's possible that you could, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to use more than that. I, I'm yeah, maybe we can, we can talk about it. Uh, uh, offline potentially. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how to do it sequentially correctly. Like, um, yeah. Okay, so let me just move on to uh, the next set. So we've we've covered guessing, betting, and learning. So what happens next? What happens next is is that uh, this problem turned out to be fairly easy, and Leila got it correct ev almost every single time in a row. So, um, uh, and just to summarize a little bit, uh, one of the tools we're using over here is what's called an E-value. This is going to, I think this concept is here to stay. And so it, maybe it's be best if everyone gets used to seeing it around. So what is an E-value? A P-value is something that's under the null, it's uh, uniform. And E-value is something that under the null, it's a non-negative random variable whose expectation is at most one. So it's a different test statistic. It's a different way of quantifying uncertainty. You can use it in the batch setting or in the sequential setting. The sequential setting, what you desire is it's a non-negative sequence of random variables such that at any stopping time, the expected value is at most one. But it's, a, it's just a complementary notion to a P-value. There are many settings in which you can prefer E-values to P-values and there are many settings in which you can prefer P-values to E-values. Um, but it, it gives an alternate way of capturing uh, uncertainty. Okay, there's so a, what happens? Uh, sorry. sorry, sorry to interrupt. There's a another E value in causal inference. I don't know if you have heard about this. That's oh, no. completely different. It's a related to sensitivity analysis. Oh, I see. No, <laughs> I have no idea. So this is not my terminology. It's been coming up in the literature and stuff like that. E stands for expect. P stands for probability. E stands for expectations. So that's why it's been coming up. Yeah, and also in Epi, if you mention E value, they're thinking of Edwards E value. I see. <laughs> Edwards value. I see. We can call it Edwards value. Okay, so what happens now when, when Leila starts to make a lot of money is that Larry comes by and he says, This this game looks really easy and 
if uh, uh, it looks like I can also make some money. I have an Italian partner. She's, uh, you know, Italians are good with their coffee. I think I can play this game and, and make some money as well. So I call this version uh, distributed hedging. Okay, so what happens when Larry says, I also want to play this game. Okay, so what happens at round T is, again, I, I show, you know, two cups of, you know, coffee. But now there's actually two people involved. And uh, just coincidentally, both of them are LW. Um, and so now, now two different people make bets as to what the outcomes are. So I'm going to call them Lambda T LW1 and Lambda T LW2. Again, these are numbers between minus one and one. And uh, they are these people's bets uh, for which, which way things are going. Okay, so, that's, so they bet. And then I reveal the answer. And, uh, and then they find out how their wealth has changed. So Larry also started off with you know, uh, you know, uh, one lira or one pound or whatever. And, and then Larry's wealth has changed and Leila's wealth has changed and so on. And so they, this, this goes on forever. Now, the interesting thing to notice is that the average wealth of the two, uh, so uh, L1 plus L2 by two, that is a, still a non-negative martingale under the null. Uh, and this is true under arbitrary dependence between the two martingale processes. And the reason is one of them is a martingale and the other one is a martingale. And these are the property of a martingale is just conditional expectation doesn't change over time. And expectations and averages commute. Like this is just the sum of expectations, the expectation of sums. And so the average of martingales is also a martingale and so on. Okay, so essentially, um, even if LT1 and LT2 are arbitrarily dependent, um, their av the average wealth is still a non-negative martingale. Okay, so that's the first thing to notice. Um, and so this is if both of them bet at every round, then I can still take their, their, the average wealth. Now, if they choose to bet on alternate rounds or something like that, so just imagine that Leila bets on even rounds and Larry bets on odd rounds, then actually the product of their wealth is a martingale under the null. So I can just take LT1 times LT2 and, I, and that's actually a non-negative martingale. And so again, you can just, if you want to say how much evidence is there against this null, I can just report the wealth. I can just report either the average wealth if both of them have been betting, or I can report the product of the wealth if they were alternating betting or something like that. But the interesting thing that this enables it, it is it enables them to cooperate and hedge their bets. So Larry and Leila can bet in different ways. And if, if Leila's betting strategy is better than Larry's, then Leila will make a lot of money, but Larry won't. But that's fine because the average will still grow large. So maybe after 25 rounds, Leila's wealth is at 62, but Larry's wealth is at three. And that's fine. I mean, the average wealth is still large. But if Larry's strategy was better than Leila's, then maybe Larry's at 48 pounds and Leila's at uh, two. That's fine because their average is still large and so on. So basically they can, they can hedge and they can decide why don't you bet using this strategy and me bet using this strategy. Obviously they can't, they can't just randomly bet. If, there's, if the null is true, then no, there's nothing they can do to get away from the martingale idea. They can't say you bet one, I'll bet minus one in every round. That will be random. That will be a martingale. They can't say, there's, essentially under the null, there's no, there's no amount of hedging and cooperation or anything they can do to get away from the fact that it's a mart their wealth will be a martingale. But if the null is not true, but they're not sure maybe which covariates are important, then Larry can say, you know, I'll use a random forest and I'll focus on these covariates and bet using this way. And Larry will say, no, I think like a sparse logistic regression is a way to go. And I think these covariates matter more and the visual is more important than the taste and so on. It could also be their skill. Maybe Leila relies more on her taste and Larry relies more on the visuals or more on the smell. So they, maybe they're measuring different covariates in order to come up with these bets. It's all fine. It's all fine. You can have different experts use different sources of knowledge, different algorithms in order to make their bets. And you can still, and they can even cooperate with each other in how to bet. And you can still have valid inference at every time. So you can take different sources of information and combine them. That's the idea here is you should think about they're collecting different covariates or have different strategies and that's okay. Uh, you, 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 you can gain power by doing that, by hedging your bets. You know what hedging means is typically you don't put all your eggs in one basket. basket. Typically you have a portfolio. You have, you have different, uh, you invest in different uh, stocks. This is the same way. If you have a multiple experts who claim to be coffee experts, some say the smell is what matters. Some say the taste, some say the color. That's fine. You don't have to decide ahead of time that I'm going to go with this expert. You can let the experts cooperate even and hedge amongst themselves and, and bet and you can take their average wealth as a measure of evidence. 
Okay, so that's what I call distributed uh, hedging. They can cooperate or not if they want to. Now the fifth version of this is what I call credit assignment. Okay, now, now two people are making a lot of money in this game because again, it's an easy game. And so this idea generalizes to any number of players. Okay, so I mean, you can have multiple people come in and they can all say, hey, I'm gonna play this game, this looks easy. I think, I think the null is false. And I think I know how to make money. I don't think these other people know how to make money, but I think I know how to make money in this game. And this is how one should bet and one should play and one should start. This is the kind of covariates one should collect and things of that kind. You're testing the hypothesis the wrong way. I will be able to test the hypothesis the right way and I will be able to make money. So all of my collaborators, these are all of my collaborators in this line of work over the last four, five years. They all say, hey, Adi, wow, you're giving away free money. Essentially, can we participate as well? Okay, so they do this. So you can generalize this to any, any number of players. But now the question is, how do you assign credit? Okay, now you suppose you, you, know, you can reject the null, but who was good and who was not? Who was good at telling coffee from, you know, coffee in milk from milk from coffee? And who was just sitting over there and randomly guessing and taking credit for, for um, you know, for rejecting the null in the end of it? And so- That would be Larry. That, that's probably, yeah, that's probably Larry sitting in the IFD, yeah. So, uh, so the idea now is you can think about this as multiple hypotheses. Okay, so there's uh, N hypotheses if you want. And uh, each of them has an E-value associated with it. This E-value is the wealth. It's this wealth process whose expectation is at most one under the null for, for any person. And there are N people. Each one of them has a wealth process. Okay, and, uh, um, uh, and they're all testing the same null. Okay, the null is that there's no difference. But they also want credit assignment. They also want to say, hey, like, look, I was the one responsible or partly responsible for making this. So here's a way to give them that credit is uh, cast this as a multiple testing problem. Okay, so think of these as n different e values for the same. And, and now you can ask which of these are, uh, can I reject which of these n different hypotheses are Larry can tell the difference between the two or Leila can tell the difference between the two or you know, Johannes can tell the difference between the two. So there are n different hypotheses you can think of. All of them are kind of testing the same underlying global null hypothesis, but you can also think of individual level hypotheses based on their skill. So this is a new procedure, uh, which, you, which, is a, which is a benjamin Hochberg procedure, but now uses E values instead of P values. Okay, and so you don't have to really, really absorb this, but if you know the benjamin Hochberg procedure, this is exactly analogous. The only difference is large uh, E-values correspond to evidence and small P-values correspond to evidence. So this as it reads is if I transformed all the E-values into P-values by inverting them by taking one over E, then this is the usual benjamin Hochberg procedure. But, but you can think of this as, uh, so we define this as the EBH procedure. Again, you don't have to absorb it, but uh, because the FDR, if you, if you know it, you know the F, you know benjamin Hochberg. If you don't know FDR, then you don't know it. But the remarkable thing about this procedure is this fact. Okay, the fact is that the EBH procedure controls the false discovery rate at level alpha under arbitrary dependence between the E values. This fact is not true for P values. It's known to not be true. If I give you arbitrarily dependent P values, the benjamin Hochberg procedure does not control the FDR at level alpha. But the EBH procedure does control the FDR level alpha even under arbitrary dependence. So they can all be betting on the same data, looking at the same data, betting on the same data, each of them has, so essentially E1 could correspond to random guessing. Let's say the first person has no skill and they're simply just guessing at random essentially. So E1 may be the null is true. E2 is the person is skillful and can tell the difference between the milk and coffee and E2 the null is false and so on. So the false discovery rate is, you know, how many of these nulls am I falsely rejecting? How many people am I giving credit to that actually don't deserve credit? That is at most alpha even though these e-values are all arbitrarily dependent, they're all based on essentially the same data. And uh, again, if the global null is true, that is, there is actually no difference at all between the milk and the coffee, then there will be no rejections with high probability. With probability one minus alpha, there'll be zero rejections made by the EBH procedure. But if the global null is false, and some people are skillful, and some people are not skillful, then the EBH procedure will identify a subset of skillful people and you know, give them the credit and it'll at most alpha fraction of those skillful people would have been false discoveries, which means they just made money by chance um, uh, and, and were not actually skillful. Okay, any, any questions about, about this? I have a quick question, which we can talk about offline too, but I'm just curious if you've thought about um, any estimation as aspects of this instead of testing. 
Yes, I, I have, and that's a whole another talk. Yes, yeah. So I have an entire. You can you can transform all of this into estimation. Yes, uh, there's this you can think of as testing that you know some effect size is zero, but uh, we can translate all of these into continuous confidence intervals for effect sizes, and they, they, I call it confidence sequences and so on. It's kind of too much for a, a single talk to introduce these many ideas. So I thought I'll stick to the testing problem. But yeah, you can convert all of it to estimation. Okay, so this was V5, which is credit assignment. Many people playing this game and you want to assign credit and so on. So here's the last version is that I, you know, all of these people who are playing this game are not actually similar. Like the, the top left are people on the West Coast. They're like hipsters. They think we have the best coffee. We know how to taste our coffee. They like, you know, we can do this better than all of these other groups. The, you know, then there's the people at CMU, which a bunch of uh, Italians or people with Italian connections were like, you know, we know our coffee well. We can do well at this. And then there are these Europeans or people outside the US who are, who are, uh, who are snobbish in their own way. So each group thinks, you know, we know what we're doing, the other groups really don't. So what's really going on is that they are willing to cooperate amongst themselves. Maybe they're, they're willing to hedge among themselves, change their betting strategies, learn among themselves, discuss. But, but actually in between the groups, they want to compete. They're like, I, I don't think the other groups can make and I even prefer that they don't make and they compete and they don't want to cooperate with the other groups. And so uh, the interesting thing is that the current framework can handle all of this. So all of these people can participate in, the in, in this betting process, whether or not some subsets of groups want to cooperate and other subsets of group want to compete. Some can make money while the others can lose money. Um, you can uh, test the global null by looking at average wealth. You can also assign credit by running FDR control procedures. And if this looks kind of similar to you, uh, familiar to you, then uh, I view this, this is like supposed to be a cartoon diagram of science. And this is kind of what's going on in science. Maybe there's an interesting scientific hypothesis of like, let's say, uh, maybe some gene related to some disease or not, or, you know, what, what's happening in some part of the universe or something like that. And there's different groups interested in testing certain scientific hypotheses. And the data often is increasing over time. There's more and more people whose genetic data is being collected and, uh, uh, you know, because they, you know, the people with Crohn's disease are being scanned, or there's more and more data from the universe that's being collected by these telescopes that are pointing out their things of that kind. And uh, maybe there are databases online with increasing amount of data um, and so on. And 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 now, like, the science community is not interested in this cooperation and competition. Science is not like, let's say, like a, I don't know, like a journal or something that they're not interested in who's competing and who's cooperating. They're trying to test a scientific hypothesis. They just want to know whatever, let's say, is there a black hole there? Or is this gene really has, does it have anything to do with this disease or not? They don't care about anything else. These other groups do have incentives. You know, maybe the CMU group wants to cooperate in order to be the first to be able to reject that null or to be able to get credit for rejecting that null or something like that. And maybe they, they're competing with these other groups. And so they don't want to share information, meaning share their betting strategy, share what machine learning algorithm is working well, uh, things of that kind. That's all okay. These groups can cooperate. They can, you, they can bet, uh, they can compete with each other. So somehow this, this allows for a cooperation competition model for testing a scientific hypothesis, which still retains statistical validity, which still can, you know, give credit assignment if needed and, uh, and is stable to these game theoretic aspects. Um, I also see that I'm out of time. So maybe I'll stop here. This is essentially my last slide. Um, I don't have this last slide figured out. It's not figured out fully yet. This is an idea I have. It's really a vision for how we can, uh, you know, test nulls together while cooperating and competing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's dependence, there's a repeated use of the same data and, you know, things of that kind. How do we handle all of these aspects in, in one kind of framework? Um, this was some kind of attempt at it really while having fun while making coffee. And so I'll just stop here and see if people have any questions and we can, you know, move to more philosophical discussions at this point. Um, I have a question. So in, in the, um, EBH slide, the theory, the theorem that you proved. Yep. Um, can that be extended to um, like a sort of a sequential setting? Yeah. As in? The, it, it holds for stopped E values. So if you have E value, if you have stopping times and you, you, you stop procedures, it, it holds true. Um, 
if you mean can you repeatedly assign a, if can you repeatedly run it at every step i'm not sure yet if you mean yeah that's what i was asking i'm not sure yet there there might be a a log one over alpha uh, overshoot so what happens in the benjamin hochberg procedure is when you apply it to sequential p values or any time valid p values is that the ftr gets controlled at alpha log one over alpha um but uh, for the ebh procedure i'm not i'm not sure yet but the credit assignment would only some somehow happen uh, at the end after the let's say the global null has been rejected and you stop and you say okay let's let's see who was responsible for this or something like that so you could think of it being applied at a stopping time and then it's valid at that stopping time i'm not sure if it's if you run the ebh procedure at every step what happens i see thank you Yeah, this is great. Andy, super interesting. Very cool stuff. Um, yeah, maybe uh, if, if people don't have other questions, uh, I, I made you host, I, I have to run, but um, next week we have Boyan talking to us about uh, maybe some potentially similar in spirit work, but um, yeah, thanks again. Andy. Super interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to stay on for questions uh, as well. You can stop the recording if you want and stuff like that. Okay. Sure. And feel free to run if you need to. Um, I, I had a question regarding that um, where you are averaging over the two payoffs, or I, yep. I'm not sure. Is it possible to take some sort of um, different convex combination where the alpha t in one minus alpha t depends on the past to kind of make it better? Unfortunately, but, not. No. I mean, you can take other convex combinations, but not, not uh, like not predictable versions. Okay. Even if it's just depending on uh, information till t minus one. Yeah, yeah, that's what predictable means. So predictable. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it, you can't take predictable versions. And the, I mean, the reason is simple. You can just do the martingale calculation, and you mm -hmm. see that if I have alpha t times l one plus sorry alpha one t times l one plus alpha two t times l two, um, and I take the conditional expectation based on the past, then I don't get alpha one t minus one times l one t minus one. I get alpha one t times l one t minus one. So like some other, like uh, the because it's predictable, it pops out of the conditional expectation and remains the same. But you want it to actually oh, uh, previous uh, convex combination. Mm -hmm. The convex combination is the same. That part is fine. But if the convex combination changes, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I missed it, but is there a way to tell when you should stop um, or what is a good time to stop that can control for something like the power level or the type 2 error? Yeah, uh, 1 over alpha. Like whenever the wealth crosses 1 over alpha, you stop because Veal's inequality tells you that, that the probability that your wealth will ever cross 1 over alpha is at most alpha. And so you stop, where, like so if alpha is 0 0.05, you stop whenever, let's say only Laila is playing the game, then Laila stops whenever her wealth crosses 20. So there's three ways to summarize evidence. You can summarize evidence as an e-value, just the wealth. It tells you how much evidence there is against the null. Like if I tell you I have made $8, you'd be like not super impressed. If I tell you I make $120, you'd be super impressed. So you can just look at the wealth. You can look at one over the wealth, which is a p-value. Or if you have a level alpha in mind, then you can you can stop whenever your wealth crosses one over alpha, and that controls type one error level alpha rigorously. Sorry, so that also controls type two error. So type two error is a question of power, and that's a, that's really a question of how different you know the two are. So like suppose you know, milk and coffee and coffee and milk are extremely different. You might stop in 20 steps if they're very, very, very similar, but there's a small difference between them. You might stop in a thousand steps. So you can't, you can't a priori ahead of time guarantee like when you will stop. Um, it also depends on the skill. So suppose, you know, suppose Layla is not, suppose th there's a difference in the smell but not in the difference in the others, but Layla is not used to thinking about the smell. Maybe Layla will never stop. Maybe Layla won't make money in this game, but somebody else. So the null might be false, but if you're not looking at the right covariates or using the right machine learning algorithm or using the right betting strategy, you may never stop. 
So it's uh, given the generality of the framework, it is not possible to give a priority guarantees on the stopping time because it really depends on, you know, how, how you bet and how, what you learned and things like that. So a good betting strategy, a good learning strategy will stop sooner and a poor betting strategy or poor learning strategy will stop later. Um, and if the null is true with high probability, you will never stop. Um, yeah, I definitely thank you. A great talk. Um, yep. yeah. yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. See you. Yeah. Thank you. See ya. Bye bye.